Hello and welcome to Harvest. So glad you've decided to join us today wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you enjoy our show. And if you do not, blame it on Chuck Freebie. What? <laughs> I'm Valerie Chuck. Oh, there's a shot of the grass Drew. out there. <laughs> blame it on the grass. We'll, we'll blame it on the switcher, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you guys doing okay this morning? Doing good. My daughter started her first day of seventh grade today. Can wow. you believe it already? Wow. It's amazing. This is Annika, and Annika. I met her uh, yeah. Saturday at, at, at World at Middlebury, Post Middlebury School, and I can't believe school starts this early. It just doesn't seem right, you know? It doesn't seem right. I know, right? And you're shipping someone off to college again, right? Yep, yep, tomorrow. What about you, Chuck? You have uh, another college student, high school. Where college student doesn't start for eh, another ten days or so. Okay. He's he's still working odd jobs all over the place, trying to get some money, and then the the rest of them. Well, a week from today, the grade schooler starts, and because um, the high school where my children go, building a new building, it's not quite ready yet. They're oh. not going to start until almost Labor Day, which, quite frankly, that's is normal. when you all that's, should start. That's right. That's when it should happen. <laughs> that's when it should happen. But I know what's happening right now. Randy Z is out back live with some awesome food he's preparing. What do you have for us, Randy? Oh, today we're going to do a grilled, believe it or not, watermelon salsa. Okay. And we're going to throw in a little everything that's popping in the garden quesadilla, and we're going to have some finger food today. Okay. Well, that's And sounds... if you don't like it, blame it on Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> You're the closest to me. That's what happened. That's funny. Hey, well, real quick, I mm -hmm. have to apologize just because <laughs> it was directed to me, but a kind <laughs> viewer, Sue, wrote in. She was upset that my grandfather's teachings, I guess, were preempted last night for the World Pulse Festival special. We apologize. Uh, I don't actually set the program schedule. Doctor here. will be back on tonight. Doctor though. will be back on, so That's we apologize right. to Sue. Well, Sue, we certainly appreciate you watching the doctor's teaching, so we're going to do better. <laughs> Wait till <laughs> basketball season. <though. laughs> then you can blame Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> well, you guys, I found this story about women in ministry, and of course, I'm always interested because voila, I am a woman. I'm not. <laughs> Just keep moving. Keep okay, moving. we'll keep it going. Anyway, it's about women in ministry, and it's a poll that re was, uh, excuse me, um, a survey that was released by Barna Group. It says researchers ask, are women happy at church? Mm. And you've heard that saying, if mama's not happy, then mm -hmm. nobody's happy. Right. Yeah. Right. I kind of think that may go work well also with churches. Barna says um, one day in a survey that was released, um, the study was conducted by surveying 603 women. Overwhelmingly, the majority of women expressed a great deal of satisfaction at church. Are you guys surprised by mm. that? Not really. Not really? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, here, here are some of the numbers. 73% of the women say they are making the most of their gifts and potential talents mm. um, in the church. 72% feel that their ministry work is meaningful. Hey, how about this? 20% uh, say that they feel honored, underappreciated mm. at church. But mm. the biggest thing probably was that they feel fulfilled in leadership. Mm. That so this is, this is women in ministry? No, women who go to Just church. Attending. Just attending. Attending church. Attending okay. church right. The survey says that women, a great deal of women within the church who attend church regularly, these women have been to church regularly within the last six months say um, that when it comes to leadership opportunities that they feel satisfied. Of course, there are mm -hmm. some who feel that they are not satisfied, right, right. you know. Mm. But 52% of the women who were surveyed who were in leadership said that they feel that the, the roles of women or the perception of a woman in ministry was Now, was leader. there a particular mm -hmm. denomination or? Across or, the board. Okay. Across the United States, 603 women were surveyed. So, mm. well, to me, it says that there's a lot of there are a lot of opportunities for women mm -hmm. to plug in and to uh, you know, be able to contribute, not just be able on the receiving end, but also on the giving end, mm -hmm. uh, to contribute to uh, the ministry of the church in general, whether it's you know community outreaches, evangelism, or small groups, or whatever it may be. Well, you know what I I like I'd like to see women move out and all areas of ministry, but sometimes I just feel like most of the time we teach Sunday school. And do the nursery. And do the nursery, yeah. you know. I don't think that would, they'd be satisfied with that, though, if that was the only options that existed. These women, 
don't know if they've got that information there, but what are they doing? I would imagine oh, it would be some, a bit broader than that. Right. They are. They just simply call it leadership, and okay. leadership could be defined for them leading worship. It could mm -hmm. be in charge of Sunday school. That's a leadership role and a, mm -hmm. a role that I never took lightly. I taught Sunday school for like five years and knew that I was making an impact. Yes. Um, yeah. So, you know, these are various areas of ministry that they're involved mm -hmm. in. But they say that there's, you know, somewhat satisfied. Of course, there are some who don't. Mm -hmm. who feel like their needs are not being met. Are you guys satisfied in church? I am. You mm -hmm. are? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you hold a leadership role? No. Okay. Drew? Sure. You? I'm, I'm satisfied. I, I mean, leadership role, I'm, I'm a lector. I go up and do readings sometimes, but I, I don't know that I necessarily hold a leadership role. Okay. They're not coming to me and saying, hey, what do you think about the doctrine? Should we change that? <laughs> okay, I think so. you're being modest. I, I feel like in, in, in your community, you're, you know, like, you're Uncle Chuck. Well, I, I, I don't mind being Uncle Chuck. I wouldn't <laughs> mind people coming and asking my advice, but I'm not sure that they necessarily want it. Sure. <laughs> well, well, just tell, uh, explain for our viewers who may not know what a lector is. A lector in, in the Catholic Church, there are a couple of readings before you get to the gospel. Believe it or not, Catholics do look at scripture. And <laughs> that there are usually about two readings before you get to the gospel reading, and a lay person like myself uh, would, would do those readings. And, and you don't try to make it necessarily interpretive, but you do try to read it in such a way where people are getting something out of it rather than sitting there and say, uh, other findings from the study show that one out of three women <laughs> oh. you know, You don't want to read it like that. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Here's one interesting, last interesting point. 78% of the women say they believe that the Bible does not prohibit women from being in leadership. That means being a pastor or whatever that may mean to you. And still to come, church planner John Harima shares how Big Life Ministries is radically reaching hurting people and the lost in the dangerous 1040 window. And in a culture where anything goes, what does your life look like? In part two of today's teaching, Drew continues the series, The Imitation of Christ. And Randy Z fires up the grill with a new way to do watermelon. And you don't want to miss his summer quesadillas. Don't go anywhere. The international news starts right now. On this Wednesday, August 15, 2012, here's what's happening in your world. A bomb has exploded in Damascus today. It's right outside the hotel where you and observers are staying. The blast occurred in a parking lot near the Dama Rose Hotel, popular with the observers in Syria. Syria's deputy foreign minister toured the area of the blast, saying none of the UN staff was hurt. The hotel was slightly damaged. Some of its windows shattered. Several fire engines arrived shortly after the morning blast to fight the blaze. It took about an hour to extinguish. Hospitals in Afghanistan are busy today treating civilians wounded in a series of suicide attacks Tuesday. The brazen attacks, which involved as many as 14 bombers, killed at least 27 people and wounded dozens more. Not all of the attackers were able to detonate their explosives, and police killed and captured several of those attackers. The bombings came during a campaign by Taliban insurgents and their allies to ratchet up attacks as international troops get ready to hand over security to Afghan forces. NATO does plan to withdraw most of its troops by the end of 2014. Territorial disputes are raising tensions in Asia. Police in Japan arrested five activists who are pressing China's claim to a group of disputed Japanese islands. A total of 14 people traveled to this group of islands on this, the emotionally charged anniversary of Japan's surrender in World War II. And that was not the only place where the territorial tensions flared. A group of South Korean swimmers reached another set of disputed islands for a separate demonstration. South Korea's president recently angered Japan by visiting those islands. Meanwhile, there was a somber ceremony in Tokyo as Japan marked the 67th anniversary of its World War II surrender. The Prime Minister Yoshihiko Noda mourned for the war dead and apologized to victims of Japanese wartime atrocities. Emperor Akihito, whose father made the 1945 National Radio Address announcing the war could not be won, also offered prayers for the dead. While Japan routinely apologizes for its wartime actions, its politicians often anger other countries 
by visiting the Yasukuni Shrine. That is a Japanese memorial that honors the war dead, including many top war criminals. In fact, some Asian countries hold ceremonies celebrating Japan's defeat. Today, South Korean President Lee Mun Bak condemned Japan for forcing thousands of Korean women into sexual slavery during World War II. And while some may say this segment often goes right into the toilet, we're actually taking you there now. Microsoft founder and philanthropist Bill Gates is holding a competition to reinvent the toilet for the two and a half billion people around the world who don't have access to modern sanitation. Scientists from around the world have taken up the challenge and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation announced some projects Tuesday that will be getting more money to take their ideas to cities. It has a real problem. It uses a lot of water. Uh, requires very expensive system to bring in very clean water. You, then you make that water dirty, you have a very expensive system to take it away, and then you have a, a treatment plant. Uh, and actually, the water you're using uh, there is, is almost 10 times as much as you use for direct human consumption. So to pass the foundation's threshold for the world's next toilet, it must operate without running water, electricity, or septic system, and operate at a cost of about five cents a day. The United Nations estimates disease caused by unsafe sanitation results in about half the hospitalizations in the developing world. The foundation expects to field test its first prototypes within the next three years. That should give them time to flush out any problems. It's that time of year. The sun's out, the flowers in bloom, and the great outdoors are calling. All you need to enjoy those summer activities is that extra boost in energy. And here at Making Healthy Choices, we've got an all-natural solution, Mineral Concentrate, a fulvic acid supplement to balance your mineral deficiencies and give you that spark to enjoy your summer. Order yours by logging on today to mhclife.com, where you'll find not only great health products, but essential health tips as well on diet, exercise, and more. Log on today, mhclife.com. You know, it occurs to me that biblical words like vows and commitments and pledges have somehow lost their meaning in today's culture. But we expect God to keep His promises to us, so why shouldn't He expect us to keep ours? Keeping a promise isn't always easy. Sometimes it requires us to take bold steps of faith. Dr. Lester Sumrall said, when you walk in the faith realm, you must accept the Word of God or you won't make it. For example, God said, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. And again, he said, when you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it. It is better you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. God will always honor his promises to you. Remember to always honor your promises to him.
In 1999, John Harriman left a lucrative landscaping career after deciding that he could no longer live day to day under the pretense that he was giving his all for Christ. One year later, John and his wife Kathy founded Big Life Ministries, and today Big Life has planted more than 7,400 churches in some of the most spiritually and physically difficult places on earth. Good to have you with us, John. Thanks. Powerful Thanks. video. Uh, got Thanks, a lot of uh, amens out of Mr. Drew Summerall like, here. Liked it. I like it. I like it. He's getting into it. Yeah, yeah, and it's a different paradigm of of church the way I guess maybe we in the Western world know it right. or think it has to be done. Yeah, our strategy is just to empower the locals. You know, we. Uh, we started going over year after year, you know, seven, eight times a year, trying to create a church planting movement and got to the point of total frustration. We weren't seeing any fruit and uh, at a point to give, ready to give up. And finally the Lord said, okay, you know, you've been doing it your way for three years, try it my way just one time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that way was to start empowering locals who are passionate for their own people to go out and make disciples of their own people and, and just allow the Lord to move. And since that time in 2003 to, to now, as you said, we've seen over 7,400 churches, 100,000 people have come to the Lord because people are passionate to reach their own people. They know how to reach their own people. There's, you know, there's a trust level there. And, yeah. and you know, they know the language, they know the culture. So. Uh, even be more than that though, what I'm kind of picking up is the, the emphasis on, away from maybe the uh, externals of buildings and programs and events and you know, uh, 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 drama or whatever it may be, you know, or production uh, to the emphasis on, on people and persons. Right. You know, and when we started the ministry, we wanted to see a church planning movement that could be reproducible. And if we went into a, build, into a village somewhere in India and uh, we built a building, the, uh, the village right next door would say, well, as soon as you build a building here, we could have a church. And we wanted to remove those obstacles. Mm. We wanted to remove those roadblocks. So we started seeing churches planted under a tree or, or in a home or along the river because every village has got a tree. So, hey, they're, meet, they're having a church under a tree there. We could have a, a church here. Mm. And just to remove those obstacles that would slow down a church planning mm -hmm. movement. Now, it seems that a lot of mission work is almost kind of synonymous with actually building a physical, right. you know, structure. So then how does the church, churches that you plant, how do they then evolve from, you know, maybe just starting, like you said, under a tree? Right. And, you know, they have the freedom and the ownership to do that. Uh, unfortunately, you know, many of the places we work, they would never have a building because it becomes a target. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. they have to kind of be underground, undercover anyway, so that's why meeting in homes, uh, you know, is, is beneficial. There's, there's other times in places like India where, where the church continues to grow underneath that tree and, and someone might donate land or someone might, you know, donate a building and they can meet there, but it wasn't our focus of, of Big Life to provide those things for them. We just wanted to continue to see the gospel moving forward from mm -hmm. village to village, state to state, country to country. Mm -hmm. Let's kind of go back a little bit to uh, the start of it all. and. Uh, you kind of got convicted and, and kind of pressed by a particular question that right. you felt the Holy Spirit kind of bring to you. Actually, you know, Kathy and I were laying on our living room floor with our, uh, our two-year-old daughter, and she was pregnant with our son, and business was great, and we were laying on the floor and just said, you know, we have the perfect life. And about two weeks later, after a renewal conference that we attended, and uh, the Lord just really started convicting us, and I was given a book, and the book was called Unveiled at Last. It's written by Robert Shogren. And in the book, it talks about the 1040 window, you know, broke our hearts. Every second at that time, someone was dying without ever hearing the name Jesus Christ one time. Unfortunately, right now, that's two people every second die there without ever hearing the name Jesus Christ. Mm. But the, the question in the book was, are you leading a little life in your own little world? Or are you willing to lead a big life? And Kathy and I were just uh, totally heartbroken. We realized that our perfect life was perfectly shallow. Mm. It had been all about us. It had been all about the American dream and success. And we, we didn't have any kingdom impact. You know, we, we were plugged into a church and we were, you know, we were serving in a church and we thought on paper it looked good. Mm -hmm. But true kingdom impact, we, we weren't having anything to do with it. So we just decided, okay, Lord, we're going to make ourselves available. And we wanted to lead a big life, a life with a big kingdom impact. Mm -hmm. And that's the birth of the ministry. Yeah. Now, when you, is, do you think this message is for all Christians? Because, you know, we, we always hear things like, well, the world needs plumbers, the world needs landscapers. Not everyone's called to be a missionary, like for you, do you feel like, well, no, that's not necessarily true. I mean, you, you, we need to go out there and do what we can to further, you know, the kingdom message. Yeah, I think it is for all of us. And I, you know, that, I'm not saying they have to leave their business or anything like that, but, but in anything we do, whether it's a plumber or school teacher or, or, or fireman, you know, we need to proclaim the gospel. You know, faith yeah. comes by hearing. And the opportunities in our 
in our circles of influence, in, in our personal mission field that are around us every day, whether it's family or coworkers, you know, something as easy as sharing our story in three minutes or less that, that you know, actually shows our, our life before Christ, our, shows our life you know, when we accept Christ and then the total transformation after Christ. Those are things that people are attracted mm -hmm. to and drawn to and want to know more about. There hasn't been a whole lot of time that's passed between when you were, you know, laying, uh, you know, block in someone's garden to today and over 7,400 churches planted in, again, some of the most spiritually and physically demanding, difficult places around the world. When you start a big life, uh, how do you go from landscaping to, you know, being a church planter and apostolic ministry and empowering leaders? Did you go to seminary? Did you, you know, were others saying, well, you really got to do this and this and this before you can even begin Did your journey? Did you make journey. a phone call? Or, you know? <laughs> no, actually, it was just a time of total seeking the Lord. Um, you know, we had some friends who were involved in different ministries, and, you know, we talked to them and got their advice. But when it, when it came down to it, we really felt like the Lord was giving us a plan. And in our minds, it didn't make any sense. You know, we, we weren't expecting any type of success, but we thought, you know, we need to be obedient. And at the end of the day, if we, if we felt that we did exactly what the Lord told us and that wasn't it, I could live with that. But if we try to do it someone else's way and it wasn't successful, I'd always wonder, yeah, you know, what, if? what if we were really, truly obedient? Right. So with respect to big life then, uh, you're in India, in, in Pakistan, uh, is it Afghanistan as well? Right. Mm. Uh, what's it like, you know, to kind of go and, and to find Christians, encourage Christians, uh, m allow, you know, the Lord to kind of put you in those positions. Uh, life is a lot different there than any of us could ever imagine, isn't it? It is. And, you know, those places, the Lord's storing and he's moving. And, you know, you, you have extremists in those areas. And because of the way they torture and treat their own people, it actually forces people to start searching for truth. Because mm. they said, you know, this can't be truth if, if, they, if they're torturing us and we're one of them. And the Lord's starting to reveal himself to people. And, and as people come to the Lord, they become more passionate about, you know, we have got to get this message out to, to the masses. And um, over the years, you know, we've seen persecution. We've seen several people who've been killed by the extremists. But what that does is it, it empowers the other ones to, to even be more confident and to, to get out and be more aggressive in sharing their story. Now, 7,400 churches, that's, that's a lot of churches. It, uh, you know, how did they relate back to the, the mother company? Is it kind of a network of churches? Yeah, there's a, you know, there's a five to one ratio. We, every church planter's got five church planters under him who's got five church planters. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we have this reporting system. And we actually have guys on staff that you know, overseas that do nothing but show up at these churches unannounced. You know, we have a chart mm -hmm. for, okay, this church meets at Tuesday night at seven o'clock and this one meets at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. And, and guys go out just for accountability reasons to make sure that's really happening mm -hmm. and show up unannounced. And, and there's this reporting mechanism that comes back. Very mm -hmm. good. Uh, <clears throat> What are some of the other distinctives that kind of make big life and the strategy that the Lord has given you maybe different than the way missions has done in the past? Chuck Colson says that, you know, big life really represents a new wave of, of missions in the world. Right. Well, I think it's empowering locals. We empower locals to reach their own people. You know, they, they, they know the culture, they know the language, they don't get homesick and they're trusted. You know, missions for the most part over the, over the years has been sending people from the West over there, trying to learn the language, trying to get their foot into the culture. We're, we're, we're using people that are already there. Mm -hmm. and how do you culture. empower them or what inputs do you provide? Uh, we provide other training, um, mm -hmm. constant training throughout the year, on-the-job training. Um, you know, one of the things I think makes us different is the, the follow-up. There's a lot of organizations that go over, they'll do some kind of evangelism crusade, get response cards, and they leave. Mm. We go into a, an area, and our church planners go into an area, and whether they show the Jesus film or, or just start making relationships, they will stay there until a church is started and then they continue to mentor those guys. I, I was in the warehouse in Calcutta a few months ago that uh, had 155,000 response cards from a ministry who did some evangelism crusades but never followed up. Mm. And um, you mm. know, you, it's easy to get decisions over there, but to but truly find- Make disciples is yeah, different. But to truly find those people that are willing to forsake all other gods, mm. you know, those are the ones that you really gotta pour your life into. And what impact has this work had on you and your family on a personal level? Um, realizing that we could never dream big enough, that God is such an awesome God and uh, his, his plan is so much greater than ours. And you know, one of the things that we just stand in awe of is, you know, Kathy and I, when we, we first started Big Life, it was just a little step of obedience. We thought, okay, Lord, we're gonna do this because you're telling us, you know, whether it's one trip or three trips. Mm -hmm. we where no where was your first st uh, step out, your first start? Uh, the first, first trip was actually to uh, Turkey and Iran. Mm. And, um, as we made those first initial steps of obedience, thinking it would just be a few trips, the way that the Lord has 
brought people together for such a time as this. He's brought some incredible, incredibly anointed people overseas who are passionate, you know, in the darkest places, the most dangerous places in the world to reach their own people. He's brought an incredible anointed staff here in the States to, to oversee that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, those are things that we never imagined or dreamed or considered being a part of. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, powerful, powerful story. You can find out more at biglifeonline.org and find out exactly the impact that Big Life is making and how to possibly plug in and be a part of that. As always, you can connect through our own website, harvest-tv.com. I want you to stay with us. Randy Z is going to be grilling watermelon. There it is in just a few moments. Many Christian ministries have desired to bring the gospel of Jesus to Israel, to proclaim his message of God's love to the villages and streets he walked while on this earth. Yet only one Christian network has been broadcasting the message of God's love to Israel for more than 10 years. By God's grace, LaCie Broadcasting has been bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ and the voices of many American ministries to every home in Israel via Middle East television. You can help this great work by becoming a partner in faith for as little as $25 a month. Call today. What would it be like if you had the energy to do all those extra things you want to do but just can't because you're too tired and burnt out? Well, guess what? There is hope. Making Healthy Choices new and improved mineral concentrate can give you an increase in performance, energy, concentration, and a general overall well-being. This new fulvic acid electrolyte mineral formula promotes maximum cell function while sparking your body's electrical conductivity. The best part is, it's only $29.95, and if you call now, we'll even pay to ship it to you. So dial 1-800-965-2345 or go to mhclife.com. Mixed with water or juice, this new and improved electrolyte formula gives me dependable energy day in and day out. And I believe it's going to do the exact same thing for you. Try it and prove it to yourself today. Call the number on the screen, call or click right now because your better tomorrow starts today. I'm here in Bluefield, Nicaragua, and I'm surrounded by street kids. These kids really don't have a place to go except here for their meal of the day. If they go home, they're potentially beaten and abused by their parents if they don't bring home enough money. They, uh, so a lot of times they don't go home. They stay here or they sleep out on the street. But the only food they get is here in this place for lunch. You know, what a heartbreaking thing. But we've got to help these kids. Just think, this little guy here, or maybe this guy here, could end up one day in the Congress, or the Senate, or maybe a mayor of this city. But we've got to get the Word of God into their hearts and lives, and we've got to get good food in their bellies so they're not hungry. This is a desperate situation for these kids. If you don't help, if we don't reach out, we cannot change this life. Your gift of $72 will provide a daily meal to a hungry child for one whole year. Call 1-888-832-6384 today. And now I'm joined by my good friend, Randy Z. We've been out here all summer long grilling, uh, cooking up some amazing summer food. Tell, tell me, Randy, what do we have going today? Well, we're going to actually grill some watermelon and make a salsa out of it, which the, right now I've got some sunflower seed oil. Okay. Make, make it the theme of the garden. And a little chipotle pepper powder in there, and I'm going to brush these up. We're going to throw them on the grill for about two minutes a side. That's going to bring out the sugars and caramelize them a little bit. And we're going to chop it up, and we're going to throw it in a blender. And we have, with that, three tomatoes from the garden. We have one jalapeno. Got to have a little bite, little spice going on in there. Some kick in there. A little kick, yep. And then we have a half a cucumber that's been diced up and seeded. And we've got two green onions. And we got a little bit of cilantro because it's a salsa kind of thing. So. Well, I have to admit, Randy, this will be the first time. You've had grilled watermelon? I've had grilled watermelon. Oh, it's good. I don't know what to expect. It just, you know, the, <laughs> Uh, when you get done with this, if you'll see the recipe online that it says to chill it for about an hour so the flavors will meld. Um, fortunately, we don't have that time, so we're going to have it just a little bit warm, but it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. But so, what, what's most important is that we want that smoky grill taste that's right. in the salsa. I was burning the grill off, and one of the guys was saying, are you cooking already? It smells like steak. I know that was last night's dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so... I got that going on there. I'm going to close the lid to trap all that smoke in there to give it a little extra flavor. Mm -hmm. And then just drop this in either a blender or a food processor. And hopefully 
it'll all chop up. If it doesn't, then we will add just a touch of water. That watermelon has a lot of water in yes, it. Yes, it does. That's why they call it watermelon. Well, tell me, what consistency are we going with here? We're going to go whatever you like. I want a little chunkiness to it. Mm -hmm. I like my salsa chunky. I like to get that crunch out of it. And uh, when we do our quesadillas here in a second, I'm going to just sweat them out because I like that crunch. I don't want a real soft, mushy. You know, I don't like warm, soft vegetables. I like yes. firm, firm, warm vegetables. And that's how we know they're not overcooked when they're nice and firm. That's right. They're firm and they're still bright in color. You'll notice that a lot with, let's say, your green vegetables, uh, broccolis, green beans, right. asparagus and things. When you get them that dark olive color, they're just mush. And you okay. don't really want that. You so. know, I've actually done that before and started over again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's gave the leftovers to the dog and yeah. started again where my broccoli was nice and bright. Well, the dog's eating good then. <laughs> yeah, At home, it. I've got a pig, so I just go so take it out to the pig if the kids don't eat it. Well, unfortunately, though, since I got the pig, the kids are, I'm noticing they're not finishing their meal because they like feeding him. Oh, they like, what's the pig's name? Bacon. Bacon? <laughs> yeah. Go figure. <laughs> I told the kids, you're going to eat bacon, you got to raise bacon. <laughs> so I'm going to flip these over now and then they another couple great. minutes. And that rind's going to hold them together and we'll chop those up. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I'm going to take our vegetables here. Now, our quesadilla is just one that I call just out of the garden quesadilla. What do you got going on in the garden? This so, is a beautiful plate. I so mean, just the color, and I, I can oh, just tell. We've wow, got a couple it's... peppers there, and then mm -hmm. we've got some tomatoes again. I still got some zucchini going on, some fresh corn that I cut off the cob, and we have some pableno peppers here, and just a little bit of onion. And now I'm just going to sweat these a little bit, and then we're going to put them in our quesadilla, and we're going to grill that. And I've got one done, and if you do these on a smaller grill, mm -hmm. and you need some room, and you can't hold your quesadilla because you don't have enough room, a good idea, which I'll show you right here, is wet a paper towel okay. and set it on the top rack and make sure that this one is off. And that wet paper towel will not burn, and it'll hold your nice and moist, and it won't let that dry out to where okay. it's really hard and crunchy. Great idea. So that's a good tip there. And we'll set this off, and we will get our watermelon out here. Let it cool for a second. So, um, you know, we are asking earlier, well, what do you got? Well, it's whatever you stop at the market and have, or you get your from your garden, or you can get, you know, uh, at the local stand in your neighborhood. That's what's going on here in this quesadilla. And we got a little Mexican melting cheese for it. And I like a little spice, so I've grabbed some uh, ground cumin here. Mm -hmm. Just gonna put a little bit of that on there. You know, I don't use a lot of salt. I think you get a lot of flavors without the salt. Right. So that's gonna give it a little earthiness. And then I'm just gonna put just a little bit of that chipotle ground chili powder on there. Okay. That's just a little hotter than the just usual chili powder there. we right. use. Mm -hmm. And I've got some taco sauce. I make all my own stuff, so that's my taco sauce for later. On you my know, recipe it says serve with, a, <laughs> serve with a lime and I don't like Tabasco, to tell you the truth. Okay, well, I make there all will my be own. no need to do the Tabasco and the Chipotle. No, um, but I like it hot, and I, okay. want, I, want oh, you okay. to, I want you to be sitting there later going, water, Ooh. well, give me some water. So here, I like using just the regular fishing knife, Okay. and it, it's, it's so skinny that you can go around the rind easier than trying to take that fat knife and go around there. Mm -hmm. So we'll just get these chopped up, and we're going to throw them in there. And what about the seeds? It's okay for them. Yeah, this is actually in. called a seedless watermelon. As you can see, it's not. Uh, they're not going to hurt you. They're going to get ground up. That's and right. I'm not going to stand here with a pair of tweezers and pick it out. <laughs> <laughs> so I get that. And we got a lot going on. Get these out of the way. We'll kind of come back. Our vegetables are good to go. Wow, you didn't let them cook more nope, than what? Just sweat it. See, minutes. see, there's just the yeah, little moisture nice. coming out in them, and that's all we want. So I'm going to throw our shell down. On, we're on high heat here for the watermelon. I'm going to crank that back down to a little medium. And we don't have to worry about the shell sticking to the grill because? Well, the grill is seasoned really well, and they're not going to stick their uh, flour. And you can use flour or corn. And if they do stick, then I'm going to get embarrassed. So. <laughs> well, this is real TV. This is, yeah. I love reality TV on this way of reality. Yeah. So half of this is our garden vegetable, and the other half's cheese. And when that shell starts to blister and brown a little bit we're going to fold it over and the cheese on top of the vegetables and then we're going to set it up on a top rack and we'll be done so i'll come back to that close my lid for that smoky flavor as we talked last time you know you do you can get grills without lids you don't have to have a lid but i like trapping that smoke and that yes. flavor in there so i always do but you see a lot of people that are grilling down the, it does. the grilling time yeah you know at home i have to tell the kids and stuff 
you put the lid on there, the water will boil faster. It traps the heat, you know, so you can just use that like we've done before. Whoops, sorry, the mm -hmm. pizza. It's just like an oven. Put the lid on it and you're trapping all that heat. And that one's about 400 degrees right now. Not so. to mention that good smoky, smoky taste flavor. Yeah. that you get. That's what it's all about. So we'll drop this in there, get our salsa done. I chose uh, a lime flavored chip to go with this. Mm -hmm. um, you can just use whatever flavor you like. I like the black bean, I like the blue corn. You know, it's all personal preference. So just gonna chop this up so that big clump's not in the blender and then we're just gonna puree it down. See all that water coming out of there? I mean, we're not gonna yeah. need a lot. We just hope that, that the weight drops it all back down there. Well, you know, that's there. what makes watermelon so good for you. It's just really water. It you is, know? yep. Just like a tomato. What was that, that Randy? That was a kernel of corn. <laughs> I'm popcorn. thinking, did, did I grab the popcorn or did I grab the sweet corn? <laughs> yeah, the kids come home last night, they were at gran great grandpa's, they go, look, I got popcorn. I'm like. Hope I didn't grab the wrong one. <laughs> so we folded that over and we put it up on the top shelf and we're gonna hold it there and that cheese is gonna melt well, a little listen, more. Well listen, here's someone waiting over here in the wings. You know I can never do the cooking segment yeah, by myself. I, I couldn't wait to sign <laughs> this, I'm sorry. Yeah, I saw him standing there. Usually you're picking. I'm, yes, I'm, I'm, it's I'm, usually me. See, I, mean, I put him to work though, but I don't do that to you. I'm supposed to take care of you. And when so he comes intrigued on by here, the grill. He's going to work. Uh, melon. Watermelon. Yeah, yeah, so this is about, you know, three good cups of watermelon in there. And you can just do the ratio as you like. And hopefully now we will, sometimes that doesn't want to drop down because of the weight. And we'll push her down there, get it blended. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, I do a smoothie too with a watermelon. He's watermelon and just your favorite sorbet. And it works really well together. So you're going to add a little more water Just to it? Just a little water because you got to get it going. A food processor would be better because it lays flatter. Okay, but when you, so now when, I when see you forget it. him from work and you have to grab something from home, this, yes. is, this is what you got to work with. <laughs> there it goes. There it goes. So this little pulse there. Mm -hmm. And you see all that, how watery that is. And that's just watermelon. So we're going to put that in here. You want it a little chunkier then, you just don't have to blend it as much. I like going back then and adding a little bit of your vegetables and things to get a little more chunk in there. That's a good presentation. Okay, okay, a little bit great. of cilantro and you on know the top. I'm big on presentation. Yeah. A little cilantro Look at on that. the top. Okay. I'll, di I'll dig a hole here. You know, I'll be the first to taste it for you. And we'll you. pull our quesadilla in here and <laughs> cut on. that up. Wait a minute. Okay, Stefan's making me wait. <laughs> Okay, there you, there you go. You, you can wow. use you can use a knife or a pizza cutter on these. And I've got a bunch more to make because, of course, you know I always take care of everybody. <laughs> gotta feed the crew. Gotta feed them. There you go. Nice. Great. Give that a try. Beautiful. Okay. Get a little bit of that with the melon on there. Mm-hmm. Well, it's nice and cool. I taste all of the flavors. The watermelon. Mm. Let's go with the wow. quesadilla. That's so different. Delicious. Well, before I take another bite, you know, you can get this recipe online, Facebook. You have a Facebook page. Comfortable cooking with Randy Z. That's right. You can get the recipe on harvest-tv.com. And uh, happy eating. <laughs> Harvest continues in just a moment. Mm. <laughs> This is the uh, birthplace of uh, Christianity, and I wanted to come to experience uh, this uh, history firsthand. It's deepening the meaning of the Bible now. It's not a place. It's, I've been there, I've seen this. Every new day brings new experiences, and we've been to places that we've read about in the Bible, we've heard about, you know, preached about, and uh, it, we are there. And it's amazing. This experience has changed my life dramatically. I think when I get back home, I'm going to be a totally different person. Just the reality that, um, you know, we were where Christ was. We had the best air flight we have been catered to here. It's been wonderful. It's been a joy. And I hope to come back someday. I think a trip like this, you can't put a value on. It, it, it was worth everything and more. It really was. I had to want to come back. I hope I can come back.
And welcome back to Harvest Word. Today we're going to move into part two of our new series, The Imitation of Christ. Now, yesterday I threw out two concepts without really any explanation, which we're going to explore today, and those are mimetic rivalry and the structure of mimetic rivalry, which is the triangle of desire. Let's deal with the triangle first. As I said yesterday, it's human nature to imitate others. Like it or not, you will imitate someone. I don't know about you, but it always kind of strikes me when celebrities or other popular folks really praise themselves as being unique. Of course, their uniqueness is always tied up in a trend, even if the trend is some sort of anti-trend, as well as the fact that declaring yourself original is about the most unoriginal thing you can do. We all know well that those who proclaim fidelity to themselves, you know, I just got to be me and all that business. These folks typically don't have any idea who they are. The point is, we will imitate someone else, every last one of us. And if we aren't conscious of who we are and who we're becoming, we will become someone other than who we want to be. Why? Because no one has ever desired anything directly. We only desire the desire of the other, which constructs a triangle of desire, where I am the subject, the thing, whatever it is I desire, is the object, and the other whom I'm imitating is the mediator. So here we have a triangle of desire. Subject, object, mediator, okay? Of course, as Rene Girard has pointed out, this triangle has no reality, whatever. It's a systemic metaphor, systemically pursued, which simply means it's not a physical thing like this sheet of paper with substance that we can touch or point to. It's simply a word picture to help us make better sense of how we interact with each other. So in other words, no one has ever desired material abundance as an absolute object. We merely desire the desire of the other. If someone has it, wants it, or we think that they have it or want it, then we want it as well. This, of course, is the seed of envy. My neighbor has something, and now I want it simply because he has it. So what do we do? We go and get the next best thing that's even better than what the other guy has, right? And back and forth we go. However, most of the time, it's not so simple. Often we're competing over just one thing, maybe a position, a social standing, a lover, a piece of land, you name it. So here now we have mimetic rivalry. We have two people, two competing triangles of desire that escalate until something's got to give way. Just like with Cain and Abel, once this tension is formed, violence is eventually the only way out. However, even as violence will satisfy everybody for a moment, it can't cast itself out. Like Dr. King said, you can murder a murderer, but you can't murder murder. But here's the thing, I'll say it again. We will imitate someone. A triangle of desire will be constructed, whether we like it or not. I think this is why Jesus said this in Matthew 6. Let's start in verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Today you have a choice. I have a choice. You will, I will desire the desire of the other, but who will be that other? The eye is the lamp of the body. If you're an imitator of Christ, you will be full of light. But if you choose to imitate someone other than Christ, you will be full of darkness. And how great is that darkness? You can't serve God in money. Either you want stuff or you want Jesus. You can't have both. Why? Matthew 12, let's start in verse 25. Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? We must see the division Christ brings in Luke 12. It's not another empire just conquering the incumbent empire. Christ's division is the dissolution of the entire so-called peaceful 
imperial system driven by violence. Empires bring false peace by violence. Christ brings love, which creates profound division. Why? Because it strips empire of its only weapon, fear, intimidation through domination. Kingdoms are going to come and go, but we can be sure that the systems of violence that sustain them most certainly remain. Christ defeated the powers that be because if, if violence doesn't have an equal opposing force pushing back against it, it simply burns itself out. Now, if envy is what fuels mimetic rivalry, how might we bypass envy? I believe the key to ridding ourselves of envy is abandoning worry, which is the seed of envy. Matthew 6, verse 25, Jesus speaking, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? To despair over possession is to construct the triangle of desire based upon envy. Why? The man who desires to become something that he does not become despairs in so much as he cannot become precisely what he cannot become, the other guy. You can't be someone else, and this is what envy attempts to accomplish. Kierkegaard said, he who wants to become himself by becoming that which is not himself despairs because he cannot rid himself of himself. And the guy at the top, guess what? The guy at the top worries way more than the guy at the bottom. Why? Because he's got everything to lose. The guy at the top is anxious because he could lose his spot at any moment. To imitate Christ, which I call the will to become the self, this requires the will to abandon the desire of the other's desire for myself. In other words, when we imitate Christ, we only desire good for others. We sacrifice ourselves for others. We love and forgive our enemy because envy has been abolished. Why? 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 and 5. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love has absolutely nothing to do with me and everything to do with the other. Why? Because it's not self-seeking. The imitation of Christ brings health to the eyes and thus to the entire body. A devotion to loving others hates what is evil and clings to what is good. What does this mean? Christian love loves without prejudice. What is the natural evolution of evil? You can start with worry. Worry eventually becomes envy. Envy breeds strife. Strife breeds malicious talk. Malicious talk breeds evil suspicion. And evil suspicion ends in violence. 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 5. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ into godly teaching. They are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of a corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. This is why Christ said, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister, will be subject to judgment. Love, love, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. In order to be children of our Father in heaven, violence has to be eliminated. But to eliminate violence, we've got to get rid of anger. To get rid of anger, envy's got to go. In order to eliminate envy, one must construct a triangle of de desire based upon true love of the other. I think to do this is to find the self. To find the self is to have found Christ. This, my friend, is the imitation of Christ. Whoever in envy refuses to imitate Christ in loving his or her enemy in true love doesn't even know God. Why? Because God is love. We'll be right back.
On the Lizzie Broadcasting Network, we enjoy the pleasure of sharing God's love on a daily basis through a variety of ministry programming. It is our hope that this programming touches every person's heart, changes every life, and that today, the lost have the chance to become a new person in Christ. The dedicated men and women who share in this calling of the gospel need to hear from you. So why not take a moment to write or email them about the impact of their ministry on your life? Your words of encouragement could be the reason others have the opportunity to accept Christ. In the Bible, the topic of healing runs like a red thread. And whether you're ill physically, emotionally, or spiritually, God has healing for you. Our new friends offer this month is Healing in Every Book of the Bible by Dr. Lester Sumrall. Full of encouragement and faith, this book cites examples of the wholeness of man from all 66 books of the Bible, and it's yours free. Just pay a small shipping and handling fee. Call 800-965-3732 or visit harvest-tv.com. And we have a number of prayer requests today that have to do with, uh, with, with healing issues. We'd love to get you this book, Healing in Every Book of the Bible. If you've never connected with us before, it's our free gift during the month of August to any new friends who would contact us at 1-800-365-3732. We do ask for $5 uh, to cover shipping so we can get it right to your door. But uh, Dr. Sumrall was a preacher of healing and uh, spoke at length about it, uh, human illness and divine healing, uh, the origins of sickness and disease, what is healing, the biblical reasons for illness, uh, why some people are not healed, and the healing covenant, and then going through every uh, one of the books of the Old and New Testament, picking out a verse that uh, ministered to him and inspired him on the message of healing as well. Give us a call today, 1-800-365-3732. We also encourage you to sign up for our e-devotional that is online at harvest-tv.com. Uh, you can uh, get a nugget to think about and ponder and let uh, the Word of God speak to your heart and soul each and every day. But just put in your first name and then your email address, confirm that email address, click the sign up here button, and every day you'll receive that nugget from the uh, Treasury of Lester Sumrall Daily Devotional. It'll be a blessing to you as well. Good word today, Drew. Thank you. Yeah, uh, very, uh, I mean, it's deep stuff, you know, that yeah. when we're thinking of the imitation of Christ doesn't even mean to be like Jesus the way we see others be like him or to, uh, uh, you know, kind of follow a set code of, of rules or or enumerated laws that are written in black and white or red mm -hmm. uh, from, from the Word of God, from the Bible, uh, but to put Jesus as the sole desire of, of who we are and who we want to be. What I see is, has perhaps been problematic is that we, we've, no, no doubt, grace is the reason for our salvation. But we put grace out there so far mm -hmm. that it's, well, Jesus knows that I can't be like Jesus, so I'm not even going to bother. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Jesus said the eye is the lamp of the body. You know, you can't serve both God and money. Mm -hmm. you got to choose. You're either going to live like Jesus or you're going to live like everybody else. I mean, that's the bottom line. You, you can't have both. You can't have it both ways and say, you know, I share in some solidarity with Christ, but I really don't have to take anything that he said seriously. Right, right. And we see that examples of that. I mean, you could look at almost every day and find examples of that uh, where we kind of segment or compartmentalize Christ and mm -hmm. you know the things that don't bother us too much well we'll agree with those and you know maybe some of those we'll actually embrace and, and execute and put into practice in our lives and, and but other things you know that we don't agree with well even though it is what Jesus did and it is mm -hmm. what Jesus said we'll kind of brush that off to the side. Well, this, go ahead. I wanted to say this you know Drew as you started I love the title The Imitation of Christ so I, I actually started a study where I'm only reading the words of Christ, Good for where you. I'm only reading the red letter print, and that's what I'm going through. I don't read anything else but the red letter print because to imitate Him is to know Him, and yeah. it starts with, with, you know, knowing His Word. And so, you know, I, I'm really interested to find out the new revelation I'm going to experience. Well, see, as a part of this here's process. the thing for me: when I go through the Gospels, when I read those red letters, it's like looking in a mirror and seeing the monster that I am. Mm -hmm. Jesus exactly. exposes me mm -hmm. for being the filthy garbage of the world the as, as, of <laughs> as what Paul said it. Yeah. I mean, Jesus exposes me for exactly who I am. Yes. And that's why I need salvation. That's why I need more of Jesus. Yeah. Because, and, and 
We can run away from it, but it's there. And that's, for me, that's what the gospel is about. Absolutely. And if you've uh, never kind of walked into this kind of in intimacy, this, this reality, uh, in your face with, with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit bringing conviction and, and instruction and forgiveness and restitution uh, to our lives and rebuilding and renewal. I want to encourage you to give us a call at our prayer line number there you see on your screen, 1-800-365-3732. We've got some great volunteers who are here today to, to pray with you and love to hear from you. Every six seconds, another child dies of hunger. The poor spend up to 75% of their income on food. 925 million don't have enough to eat. It only takes $6 to feed a child for a month. Do your part. Call 1-888-832-6384 or visit feedthehungry.org. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. From violent people you save me. I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Want to accept Jesus as your personal saviour, or have questions about Christian life? Call Prayer Line at 1-800-365-3732. The Harvest Show is produced by LaCie Broadcasting and is viewer supported by people just like you. Thank you for inviting us into your home today.